breaking down our recent best ball mania four draft. That's what we're talking about today on Stealing Bananas. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find my newsletter at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his great work at Rotoviz. And this is the draft that for listeners who maybe didn't hear, we got the 110 pick in the first round. We had a slight technical difficulty. We were trying to go CD Lee, and we ended up with Bijan Robinson. A nice consolation prize. And from there, we went Bijan Robinson, Amon Ross, St. Brown, Debo Samuel. At the four, uh, excuse me, at the three, four turn after Debo Samuel, we took Jameer Gibbs. And then at the five, 10, we got a nice value on Kenneth Walker. So we wound up with three running backs in the first five rounds. From there, Traylon Burks and Brandon Cooks got us back to four receivers. But we were outside the wide receiver window pretty much. And Brandon Cooks, not a player we take a lot of anyway. And he's our wide receiver four. DeAndre Swift, Dak Prescott in the next couple of rounds. Romeo Dobbs, Rondell Moore helped us get a little bit more wide receiver depth in the 10th and in the 11th. Jared Goff built out the Detroit Lions and Dallas Cowboys bet that we had where that's the Week 17 matchup that we were correlating. We had also taken both Amon Ross St. Brown and Jameer Gibbs for Detroit. So taking Goff there. Um Certainly made that bet on the Detroit Lions offense more aggressive. Uh, from there, Cole Komet, Raheem Mostert, Curtis Samuel, Wandale Robinson. And then our big discussions late about how to close out our tight end room. We went with Trey McBride and Hunter Henry. Sean, I think, would have preferred to go with Michael Mayer. I was talking through potentially adding jo uh, Josh Ferguson. I don't even know the guy's first name. John Ferguson? Joel Ferguson? Steve Ferguson? No. I mean, he's a, he's a made-up player, but I wanted to add him because he is potentially <laughs> the guy that can consolidate the routes for the Cowboys. He would have given us a Dallas double stack with Dak and Brandon Cooks because we did not take CeeDee Lamb. Again, a, a fun one to look back on when we wind up so heavily uh, involved in the Dallas-Detroit game that we didn't take CeeDee Lamb early. But, I mean, it, it, you know, things can play out in fun ways, and um, – you're never mad about Bijan Robinson, but Sean, that's how the team shook out. That's what we're going to talk about today. But yeah, how you doing? <laughs> good, good. This was a fun draft. It was a very challenging draft, which is great because then you are better in your preparation for drafts going forward. And maybe you have an interesting, unique draft where you grab a couple of those guys that you don't normally get. For me, I think a player who is really interesting is Brandon Cooks, where for a veteran, I think his range of outcomes are extremely wide. His season last year wasn't particularly good, and he's never been this league-winning type of player. And yet, as you move back into this Dallas Cowboys offense, the potential for him to blow up is pretty significant. Now, you also have Michael Gallup coming back healthier. And so I think it is actually pretty interesting and tricky to go through this Dallas Cowboys offense. It's maybe the only question mark I have when I'm thinking about C.D. Lamb in the first round. For a while, I really actually felt comfortable with him. And I, I would still say that I think that Lamb, Wilson, Amon Ra, Waddle. I think that those guys are better picks than AJ Brown, Stephon Diggs, and Devontae Adams. But within that context, I'm warming up to Wilson, Amon Ra, and Waddle as maybe the best ones, in part because I don't know how to really confidently look at this Dallas offense and say, I think that a specific guy is going to get enough of the team volume and the team with McCarthy in charge is going to be good enough to really demand these types of prices for the earliest guy. So we look at Liam, we were going to take him. I do like that pick, but if, if we're going to kind of then work back through it and try and figure out what does the draft then do for us? Are we okay with missing? I guess I'm okay with missing. I'm okay with getting Brandon cooks instead at that price at the 710 i like him right there i think that he works i think it's an interesting move with amon Ra, and then i like that prescott who was a couple picks below adp i like that one of the things though ben i kind of have two questions for you here as we work through this number one i do always feel a little regret i think when i end up with this kind of lamb or saint brown start 
because it does then put you in this mindset where you're looking at Prescott and Goff. And at the end of drafts, I always feel just kind of lukewarm about that. So do you have any concerns yourself when you're drafting that those early picks are going to start to push you down a path of game stacking players where, I mean, you're not out on them, but, but maybe they're not your favorite guys. And then you talked about this a lot as it related to the tight end at the end of the last show, but how are you looking at those receivers? I guess even after hearing you discuss that, my thought process was, I mean, we could have players in this offense take market share chunks away such that it actually makes the offense pretty hard to play unless Prescott really, really impresses in 2023. There is so much to get to there. It's a great place to start. I think the first thing I want to mention is completely agree with your comments that these are the types of drafts that really challenge you. This is such a fun draft to sort of look back on and think about what we might have done differently or wanted to do differently. Neither of us, I, I think, feel like we hit a complete home run here. But when you get into some rooms where you're not you know, making the picks that you want to make or things aren't falling the way you want to, you also want to also be able to build it in a way that can win. And I think one of the big elements for me from our buddy Pat Corain winning the whole thing last year, winning $2 million, was um, the fact that he had some pieces in there that he didn't really intend to have. He famously only took Taekwon Thornton once and had him on that team. Also, it was like a Tom Brady, you know, uh, Bucks and Panthers game stack for week 17. Um, and like I don't, I think I, when we talked through that with him that he wasn't like super high on Brady. I think he liked him. But um, there's certain elements of it certainly that were structurally exactly the things that he wrote about, which is also a really cool part of that where he had written a lot about double anchor QB and how he would attack quarterback or double anchor running back and how he would attack quarterback on some of those builds. And it's like it was so cool from a structural perspective how it went right along with the stuff that he had written about. But I know for him, he would say that there's – I don't want to speak for him too much, but there's parts of it that he was trying to make that roster work, but it's not necessarily pieces that he loved, like we were talking about here. And so it is interesting. You have to be willing to say, look, there's a lot of things that can happen in the NFL season, and I'm open to uncertainty and, and potentially not being correct on everything. Um what I'm you hearing today able- is that you are very excited that we have pieces from both sides of the Arizona Chicago Week 16 game. That's going <laughs> to be the key to our finals advance. That's the one that, um, yeah. I, I, if that happens, Sean, I'm going to have to put it on the record now. Uh, that's the one I was wrong about because <laughs> I can't say I'm particularly optimistic about that. But. That's why you mix some of those things in. You can't be completely, especially, and that's what's so fun about best ball. I mean, you get so many options to build so many teams that you can do a lot of different constructions and you're trying to make the different puzzle pieces fit without being too idealistic, but at the same time, having strong opinions and strong convictions in the players you do like. Then there was the other comments you made about the Dallas offense I want to get to. And I think that's really interesting. A couple notes from my projections. It's a team that I felt, there was a lot of interesting stuff when I got through my projections. So um, the first one is this team was so concentrated last year. Their number four wide receiver in targets, number four, had 10. It was T.Y. Hilton. He only played three games for them. They picked him up late in the year. We might have all memory hold this, but T.Y. Hilton played a few games for the Cowboys last year, 10 targets. He was their fourth most targeted receiver. Jalen Tolbert did not get more targets than that. Simi Fahoko, some of the guys that we were talking about as youngsters that maybe we're going to mix in. Cavante Turpin was their, you know, kick returner that they brought over from the USFL, um, but didn't really get any actual playing time. And that's despite Michael Gallup playing really poorly coming off the ACL and Noah Brown playing very poorly. But those two guys did not lose snaps. They were a very heavy, concentrated three-receiver uh, rotation. It wasn't a four- or five-receiver rotation. And similar at tight end, you had Dalton Schultz consolidating the vast majority of the work there. Um, But when I look at this team this year, I feel like we're basically in the same situation. They still have Turpin. They still have Tolbert. They still have Fajoko, but those guys don't seem to have made much of an impact last year. It doesn't speak real well to them that they couldn't get on the field when Gallup and Noah Brown weren't doing much behind Lamb. And now you have Brandon Cook. So what does it mean for this year? Well, I projected them to be a very concentrated three receiver set as well. A lot of people are in on Gallup as a potential bounce back 
now that he's two years removed from an ACL. The notes on him when I went through the, the projections were just a reminder that his really good year was 2019. He had a 2.16 yards per out run, strong targets per out run, strong yards per target, all career highs. That dropped off in 2020 and 2021 before his 2021 ACL in a sample of over 950 routes over those two years because they ran a lot of plays. He ran over 600 routes in 2020, about 325 before his ACL tear in 2021. Huge sample where he was nowhere near the player he was in 2019. He was at 1.34, 1.37 yards per out run in those two seasons. So a lot of people that are saying, oh, two years removed from an ACL, he's going to be back to what he was. Well, what? What are we saying? That 2019 year that was his best season or the 2020 and 2021 years where he looked like just a guy for a long stretch before the ACL, and then he was even worse last year coming back from the ACL. But they still ran him on a ton of routes. They're going to run him on a ton of routes. I think he can bounce back. I think there's still potential. He could be somewhere at least in between the 2019 season and 2020 and 2021 stuff. I'm just saying I think – People that think Gallup's really going to bounce back are probably optimistic, but he is going to run a lot of routes, which leaves a lot of target volume, I think, in terms of consolidating for Lamb and Cooks. The one thing I – and so I I think what, when I did the projection, I wound up very optimistic about Cooks in the ways that you described. We know his profile has played on a lot of different teams. He's not like a, a massive target earner. He did have one really strong season in Houston in terms of target share, but hasn't been like a huge, huge target earner. But – um is able to get it at higher a dots and be efficient and it all plays. And I think that works really well for what this offense needs. And I think he could be really good for them this year. The one part where you were sort of concerned about CD lamb, I just see CD lamb as a guy who can consolidate so much now because of these other concerns that I've mentioned and the way that the depth receivers aren't really a threat. And I mean, especially if you're out on Ferguson or anybody at the tight end position, really doing much, I mean, Dalton Schultz last year was there taking some target share that if if Jake Ferguson or anybody gets anywhere near that, you're talking about those guys being pretty big hits at tight end. So by not playing the tight ends, we, you described on the last show, we're kind of thinking that this is going to be pretty wide receiver centric passing game. I get that. But it, but I, I certainly think in those scenarios, you're talking about C.D. Lamb being pretty, pretty special because he last year took a jump forward and targets per run of over four percentage points, really took that step forward to an alpha level, added the additional routes, added the targets per route on top of the additional routes because he'd never really been a 100% route share guy even before last year and stayed efficient. You know, he didn't get – the one thing that wasn't a career high was his yards per target wasn't a career high. That was his sophomore season. He had a 9.2 yards per target. Last year is 8.7, but still good. And then he has nine touchdowns. He does have a career high in you know in touchdowns. Everything hit for him last year in terms of earning more volume and the efficiency. But the efficiency has been strong all three years, and the volume has been pretty good. And this is the type of breakout that like we talked about. This is what a breakout for Lamb would look like, and it looks exactly like that. And so looking ahead at, at the Cowboys, I feel like how to play it is fairly straightforward. The ways that they were so concentrated last year, I do think probably carry over, even though that Kellen Moore is not there and it's you know now a McCarthy offense because the same depth receivers are there, Tolbert and Fajoko and guys that couldn't get on the field last year. I do feel like it's going to concentrate a ton on Lamb and potentially on Cooks and potentially also Gallup or maybe a Jake Ferguson, but maybe those guys aren't there and that just makes Lamb and Cooks that much better. But like all those trends point to this being – you're talking about whether or not to play this passing game. It does point to me that Lamb is a guy that I actually think can contend at the back of the first round with the receivers at the top of the first round. I think he has the potential to have like 180 targets and be in the conversation with obviously Jefferson, Chase, Cup, Tyreek Hill. I like that. And I think that it's also important to remember – even extending back and kind of what this trajectory is. I think it's easy to be disappointed in Lamb only from the sense of not being already in that Jefferson Chase mix. But you're talking about a guy who had ridiculous yards per route numbers in college that don't completely show up in some of the other metrics because of the number of routes that he ran. And then he comes in and over the second half of his rookie season, you're talking about back when Michael Gallup was good. And one of the reasons that Gallup has been down since is simply that CD lamb is just so much better. 
And so you don't get as much target volume there. He comes in and over the second half of his rookie season, I mean, you're talking about a team he was dropped into that had Amari Cooper, who obviously had a little bit of a rebirth when he got away from him last year, and Michael Gallup, who I mean, we tend to forget what Michael Gallup was doing in the past, but isn't anymore. And so that's been a big part of our argument for Jackson Smith and Jigba is that people who had those types of numbers in college can come out and do it right away. So to kind of (laughs) finish my point though, Leon like barely edged Cooper in points over the second half of that season. And when you're talking about a three receiver mix, I mean, yeah, maybe that does limit JSN a little bit too compared to what he would have been elsewhere. But I mean, I think you could make a pretty strong argument for picking JSN even earlier if you weren't on the Seahawks. So you look at that trajectory and what you described for Lamb last season, I think it makes him a good pick. It's why I do think that he should be going ahead of A.J. Brown, going ahead of Stephon Diggs. We didn't pick him, but then we do make that play, like we said, of taking Brandon Cooks. And after you kind of described where you're at with it, it fits where I am with Gallup. And so you look at Gallup, he goes... At 12.09, we took Rondell Moore at the 11.10. And I'm sure some people are looking at that and thinking, well, Gallup might have actually been an interesting pick onto this team as well. You get a little bit of optionality, but also you're hoping a rising tide lifts all boats. You're hoping that Prescott gets volume to both of those players and that the offense in general is efficient. But I guess my view of it as well, and one of the reasons why we ended up with Moore and the way that my rankings that we had loaded in are set up. I mean, Michael Gallup never really comes into play for me based on where he's ranked <laughs> versus ADP. And so those two things track. Yeah. In hindsight, goals. in hindsight, maybe he would have made some sense for the reasons you said, but yeah, he wasn't even someone uh, for anyone who listened to the actual draft show that we even really discussed. But yeah, there's some scenarios there where Gallup does get back. I mean, obviously there's uncertainty. I'm talking about like, what I think is the most likely way to play this offense or to think through this offense and what it is, but everything I just argued in that long Dallas Cowboys rant, like could be completely wrong. I mean, that's just one of those things in football. Like we have to be aware that like we can be way off CD lambs big season last year could have been a mirage. It could fall back down this next year. That happens sometimes. Uh, and Gallup could bounce back to some of those early career numbers. Um, so yeah, I mean, that would have been an interesting way to play that. But I, I, I'm with you. I, I don't think in hindsight that I wish we had him. I kind of like the single stack, honestly, because I think we're saying that Cooks is going to get up there with Lamb, but it is going to be a pretty consolidated two-man show. Dak's going to have a really good passing year to both Lamb and Cooks. But Lamb's a really pricey player. You don't have to have every good producing first-round pick on your roster to win. I mean, there's going to be teams that have good players that don't win and the winner is not going to have every good player is the other way of putting it. It, do, it seems weird. doesn't really make a ton of sense, but I do think the Dak Cooks single stack can work um, where like Lamb can have a really good year, but Cooks is the one who is really beating his price by getting up close in production to Lamb somehow or another. And he certainly has the talent to do it. Sean, the other guy that we took as part of this game stack we talked a little bit about, you mentioned as you were talking through the Lamb stuff and, and the late first round receivers is Amon Ross St. Brown. I'm right with you on the Waddle, Garrett Wilson, Amon Ross St. Brown grouping, but Amon Ross St. Brown in particular, you have Jamison Williams suspended for six games. You have Amon Ross, a guy who missed parts of games early last year. So there's a lot of stuff when you look at you know points per game and fantasy points per game and uh, yards per game and catches per game. I always like to highlight those players that had multiple games that they left early where the points per game stuff is not really that helpful. That's why I focus so much on the actual per routes run. If you look at Amon Ross St. Brown's per routes run um, profile, you're talking about a guy that basically looked like Cooper Cup last year, not Cooper Cup 2021, but not Cooper Cup 2022 wasn't that different than 2021. He was a little bit less efficient but he was earning almost exactly the same amount of volume when he went down. But these are guys that Amon Ra in 2022, Cooper Cup in 2022, uh, their targets per out run were 0.01 apart. Their weighted targets per out run were at an air yards were identical. Their A dots 7.5 and 6.7. Amon Ra has the slightly lower one. Their slot rate in the 55% to 60% range for both, but they both split outside of the slot a little bit more than maybe you'd think. 
8.5 yards per target, 8.4 yards per target. It comes out to where their yards per route run was 2.40, both of them. 338 routes for Cup, 483 for Amon-Ra. It's a super similar slot plus profile. And that the targets per out run in particular getting up around 30 and the weighted targets per out run getting to where it is. I mean, again, Cup had 10.9 targets per game last year. The year prior in 2021, he basically had the best wide receiver season ever. He, he ended up with 191 targets. He had 11.1, 11.1, then down to 10.9. So in 2022, again, slightly different profile than 2021, and I'm making this comparison to 2022 for a reason, but his target earning cups was very similar to what he did in 2021. It's just that in 2021, the efficiency spiked. Amon Ra was able in 2022 to post a very similar target earning profile at a similar A dot, similar slot rate, similar you know yards per target even, which includes yak and all of that stuff. The question is, can his efficiency spike for him to really get to like elite Cooper Cup numbers? But even if he can't spike the efficiency like that, I'm basically describing a target earning profile that has 180, 190 target upside like Cup did again back in 2021. So um, definitely excited to get Amon Ross St. Brown on this team and agree with you that early second round range of receiver, him and Garrett Wilson and those guys, I mean, I want a lot of those guys on teams this year. And Amon Ra may be first among them. And you say first among them, it's not hard to understand why. I mean, you gave just a beautiful breakdown of his specific profile. You contrast that with Devontae Adams, who goes one pick ahead of him here and is one spot more expensive by ADP. You look at those two guys and you think about 2024 ADP and I mean, they could end up back together, but there are so many scenarios in which Amon Ra is growing where Tyreek Hill is going now and Devontae Adams is going where, you know, DeAndre Hopkins or Chris Godwin are going, or even worse, because when you get to be that age and you have a bad quarterback and you have bad coaching, then, I mean, you can just absolutely fall through the floor. Well, you say, well, that's not relevant. We want to know about the points this season, but it will be based on that. So you have a lot of risk with Adams, still some upside. I guess I'm actually more concerned about him even than most people are. And I'm sure that, I mean, when you're getting him in the second round, that already reflects concern when you consider how good Devontae Adams has been the last couple of seasons. But you look at Jalen Waddell, and he's probably the number two. That's not a huge issue because those two guys are sort of co-ones with nobody else taking any volume away but he's kind of the number two Devonte smith the number two on a team that's going to be run heavy t higgins the number two and as good as he is the clear i mean he's just not anywhere close to jamar chase jamar chase is that good chris olave some crazy weighted target per route numbers as well and yet he's going to be there with Derek carr now you say with amon ra he's with Derek goff right and i've always been a Derek carr supporter and yet at the same time and chris olave had bad qb play last year and so you're thinking, I mean, all Carr has to do is be like basically as good. But when you're thinking about the upside, the median, the risks and the downside concern for that group, I mean, I like the second round receivers. And yet, I mean, we're drafting guys in many cases because of the offense and because of how things could hit in a positive scenario. And you need to think through that. That's going to be important. But I mean, as you look at Amon Ra, so many ways that that, I mean, basically just has to stay healthy and he's going to smash at that point. I do think that Jamison Williams comes back and then you have maybe a little bit different scenario for the fantasy playoffs, the lack of other guys there. I mean, they've added Marvin Jones. I mean, that's just a complete capitulation move saying like, we want to have people to run some routes until Williams comes back. It's one of the reasons why I think Sam Laporta is one of the best picks in drafts. I actually have too much of him. He was picked ahead of ADP in this one. And that caused some problems for us because we wanted to get upside at the tight end. One of the things, Ben, that I do think is kind of interesting when you're starting to look at these tight ends is Dalton Schultz. He's someone like Komet who I do have struggle with when he falls because I think he could do some of the same types of things in Houston that he did in Dallas. Make sure you check out our show on the Panthers, the Texans, and the Indianapolis Colts for a deeper dive into that. But once you get into that round 9, 10, 11 range, it does get interesting because 
underdog allows you to wait at tight end. And yet if you do wait, then you get into some of the discussions like you and I had. And that brings us back to this question of, could we have done things differently? What should we have done differently? I think we like the DeAndre Swift pick in round eight. That was below ADP. I think we're okay with the Dak Prescott pick in round nine. That was below ADP. I think we like the Romeo Dobbs pick because it was avalanche and and we think Dobbs has upside well above his price. But when you do that, then you're going to miss on Greg Dulcich, who, I mean, Dulcich has no floor at all. And so there's a huge amount of risk there. And yet kind of interesting. We talked in the intro. I try to avoid the players that have no floor at all. When we can't drop players in best ball, I try to avoid the players that have no floor at all. Well, speaking of players who have no floor at all, you had mentioned some concern about Trey McBride as part of our group, but he's at the end of drafts and looked really good in the last two or three games. One game there where he looked fantastic. He is incredibly athletic for a tight end. Arquise Brown, an iffy number one. Rondell Moore, an iffy number two. A guy who wasn't good in college is generating rave reviews in their offseason work, in part because he's being contrasted against other guys who aren't good. It's they probably going to be not great. even start George... their second best QB in the first half of the season, which would be catastrophic. We've selected Rondell Moore in round 11. I still think that Rondell Moore could be one of the most electric players in the NFL. But I mean, that's the pick where I'm looking at him like, does that pick make sense with this team? Should we have done something different? Are you concerned about him if you're concerned about McBride? What are we doing right here? So um, first of all, in terms of the different picks you were talking about, as you were talking through that, I think the one, if I if I had a perfect you know knowledge of everything that was going to happen, for me is Dak, where we, we I do think the single stack can play, but because we didn't have Lamb and because we wound up getting golf behind ADP, which is not something you know when you're looking at Dak and you're thinking, oh, we can play this game through Dallas. But in hindsight, knowing that we got golf at the 11-12 turn, uh, I, I think probably I would have taken an elite tight end there. We were sort of through the wide receiver window. We did get Dobbs at that turn, but Sky Moore had already gone pretty high ahead of ADP. And at the turn, you have Pat Fryermuth, and I look at him, and I think he's a pretty interesting tight end bet for the things that he's done. Probably not dissimilar in your mind to Komet and what McBride can be, and they're guys that had really good prospect profiles. For me, there's, a, I guess, a little bit more of a I've seen it already with Fryermuth in terms of his profile at the NFL level, and maybe that's a fault on my end. But as far as McBride's concerned, you talked about him looking good late, and I do recall the same, but I was also pretty underwhelmed in the spots where I needed some big points out of him for two reasons. One, I had written all off season or all season and stealing signals about how annoyed I was that Zach Hurts was getting the number of targets he was. Because he was just running five yard stops every single time, but he was getting targets. Uh, he had a massive target share. And so I thought McBride, after Ertz got hurt, was going to step into this role that should easily work. And then on the, the second is basically that he could then expand on that role because he is more athletic than Ertz. And all Ertz was having to do to get these targets underneath in this offense last year was turn around, you know, find holes in the zone. And McBride came out, ran 317 routes, and had a targets per run of 12.3%, a yards per run under one. Which is good. His actual stats on those routes were really poor in a situation that Zach Ertz, who I was making fun of and stealing signals every week for, you know, for months, was able to actually turn volume out of that. Now, to be fair, Zach Ertz has always been able to draw volume and has some skills, and this doesn't mean Trey McBride sucks, but it was disappointing to see. Zach Ertz is back there this year. I am projecting, like in my projections, for McBride to see more volume than Ertz, that for him to sort of take over. But maybe early in the year, Ertz is still too involved for what we like. And then you have the situation where the Arizona offense is the lowest projected in the look-ahead lines, the lowest projected total points of any team in the NFL. You have how do you feel questionable? Go ahead. The kind of split <coughs> in their scoring between potentially being a massive anchor that drags you down and hurts your playoff advance over the first half. And then the potential for them to outperform late with Kyler coming back because yeah, I think it's, I mean, for Moore and McBride, 
to work on this team. We're going to need some of their guys to stay healthy and get us there. And then we're looking at them as potential second half trump pieces. And yet all you have to do is look at last season where it's a, a different dynamic, you know, suspension and lack of, you know, <laughs> recent snaps, all of that kind of thing as opposed to injury. But the people who are betting on getting their team there and then Deshaun Watson and his pieces carrying them. Those bets are can be hard to make. And I don't know that we know that Kyler Murray is even good enough necessarily, especially in a new offense, to make that bet. I, I guess I, I want to find something positive about Arizona to say here. And yet, I mean, do you think they're going to be the lowest scoring team or do you think they're going to be in the bottom five once he comes back? Well, that's a question I had when I went through the projections and did them. I mean, I wrote, like, can they really be as bad as the market thinks in particular because their full season numbers have them as, like, well below even the Bucks as the next lowest team in terms of, you know, we're talking about look ahead lines, spread and totals. And shout out to a uh, uh, former road of this guy, established the runs, Jack Miller, who looked up that stuff. And I, I talked through it with uh, our buddy Mike Leone on my projections podcast over there. But, um, those numbers have Arizona well below even Tampa Bay in 32nd and not even particularly close to 31st and Houston's 30th. And it's like, is Arizona that bad? I mean, they still have playmakers here in, you know, I think Marquise Brown's a pretty solid receiver. I think Ronald Moore has some potential, but the expectation in the market, if you look at the win totals as well, their win total is the lowest, I think. And it's been bet to the under, like it's really, Everyone thinks they're tanking. The market seems to think they're tanking. And there's a it's strong betting trends on it. Like if you think that Arizona is going to be good, you can take the over on their win uh, win total and get, I think, plus money on a really low number. I mean, it, like even if they're, you just think they're going to be good for the second half of the season with Kyler, and that's the part that's really confusing for me because if they're 500 for eight games under Kyler, they're basically hitting their win total. I think their win total is four and a half, and they could go four and four in the final eight games and hit that. You know, are they going to be – Oh, and nine at that point, I, you know, so the, the, the market is saying it's not optimistic about even when Kyler returns. And I think there is concern about, at least in the market, about Kyler as a passer at this point, And then certainly what he would be like as a player returning from an ACL where he maybe isn't as mobile in that first year. So maybe there's some that's saying, okay, now he has to be a pocket passer. He's so small. He can't move around. He won't be as mobile. It's not going to work. The issues we've had, a lot of people have had issues with Kyler Murray's height and everything else since day one, but I, I do think they're overstating it. I think Kyler, even with lower mobility, can still be an average to above average quarterback, but I think the market thinks he's a below average quarterback in that situation. I mean, to really parse it and get down to it, I think that's what the what the what the the win total over unders and those things are telling us. But I I think the way you framed it is is smart and interesting to think through that um, after he returns, there's a potential for the, the offense to actually be average, which would be way better than what I'm talking about. And the concerns that I have about the, you know, like when I go through the projections and I try to pin it to market expectations and I can't really easily project big touchdown rates. The You asked about Rondell Moore as well, along with McBride. The reason I'm a little more optimistic in Rondell, a couple of reasons. One, when you go to his yards per out run profile, year one, 1.2 a dot incredibly low but he had a really strong target sprout run of 24 percent now that dropped all the way back to the 19.6 percent last year when his a dot rose to 5.2 he started to get some downfield work he actually got some air yards but he wasn't like i mean the, the reason he was a 24 percent target sprout run as a rookie was it was a lot of uh, manufactured touches the routes themselves were basically short passes his a dot was 1.2 right it was like tip passes on jet motion and it was swing passes and um, but still they were manufacturing touches for him. And even when the ADOT went up, they still manufactured touches for him. They do have a new coaching staff, but I think with the lack of playmakers and skill set, and we like Rondell Moore's um, skill set, his four, three speed is he's short, but he's uh, incredibly athletic, strong. He averaged in both seasons over seven yards of yak per reception, which is a really strong number. Again, low ADOT, you would expect that to some degree. But it stayed high even as his ADOT got higher and he started to add some air yards. My thought with Rondale is there's this potential for that Debo light 
profile, still, still a potential fourth that we've talked about, which is he gets enough manufactured touches. You're getting sort of free receptions. You're getting the potential to have this 20, 25% targets per out run, which might be fake or fraudulent or inflated, but still counts for fantasy points. These are still targets. That's why I like to look at targets per out run. I get a lot of comments about targets per out run that we got to have context. We've got to think about all the, you know, the ways that it can be. Well, I'm trying to, to calculate targets because that leads to fantasy points. We go all the way back to fantasy douches, targets to the lifeblood of fantasy scoring. I can put in the context of what Rondell Moore's profile is, but I want to know how many targets he might have the potential to get. I don't care if they're cheap touches. I don't care if it's inflated what he actually is as an NFL player. If he's getting a whole bunch of cheap receptions, then he has the potential to have a high reception season. We play points per reception in a lot of these leagues or even half point per reception can add up to, to quite a bit of numbers. And then he has this yak ability. He has, you know, he's shown at least some. And there's the the upside case for him is that hey, he starts to do more downfield like Debo's breakout season. He gets enough of those free catches and gets to 80 receptions, right? Or 80 plus receptions. Um, and he's able to do a lot after the catch and be explosive with the ball in his hands. I that's a profile I still want to bet on. And I think I've seen enough in the first two years of how he's been used and what he's been able to do in those spots that makes me think there's still an upside profile there. I still think there's an upside profile with Trey McBride. I'm not writing him off, but the the difference in those two for me is that I I find more optimism in what we've seen from Rondell Moore so far. I love to hear that because Rondell still one of my favorite players. I have stopped drafting him outside of the draft (laughs) after the, DeAndre Hopkins release I think before that he was a great pick I think after it it, it's just hard to see how it works out but when I'm looking at round 11 and wrapping that back around the running backs who are available there Jalen Warren pretty interesting because the Steelers could be very run heavy and we know that Najee Harris not likely to be one of the more efficient running backs in football this is the year where we could actually see a lot of loss but when you're looking at warren kendra miller tank bigsby roshan johnson i like those guys but i didn't feel like they made sense for this team and you would want them you know below these prices so running back pick didn't make sense we knew we were going to have chances to get our fifth guy later you look at the tight ends tyler higby who is basically a tight end screen guy. I mean, that could work out as you just mentioned targets, very important, but then you're looking at Dalton Kincaid, Gerald Everett. I don't know if that makes as much sense this year as it did last year. We played that it worked. Okay. And then you're coming back around Dalton Schultz, Irv Smith taken ahead of our tight end pick. I'm not excited to get those guys when we're trying to build this three and late and Laporta goes ahead of ADP. We were, we're trying not to reach for him, especially when we don't have Jerry Goff yet. And so as I'm looking at other options, I I guess I still think even when we have time to really go through it, that, I mean, that's as good a pick as anything else. I mean, we could have picked Odell Beckham. That was the other thing we were joking about. So I guess in the recap, I like that okay. We talked a little bit. About- I, I want to know why you're concerned after the uh, Hopkins. I, I just did a whole optimistic take on Rondell Moore. What, give, give the people the pessimistic take after the Hopkins – cut you said you don't like the run on more play as much why why so well i wanted to get him at really depressed prices where people are thinking this offense is bad and he's not going to be out there i think he's going to be out there either way i think you're going to have a lot of three receiver sets but his price rose because of the expected targets right and so once he moves up to the number two slot and people are like oh now he's going to play and we're going to price him on being out there you and I, I have talked about this, obviously, for <laughs> since the very beginning of Stealing Bananas. I, I want to be skeptical of buying guys just because they're going to be out there. And so when I look at it and I contrast Rondell Moore to Curtis Samuel, who is basically what we want Rondell Moore to be. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> Don't do that because you're, you're, too, you're too right about it. Don't do that. That's, that's brutal. You know, we ended up taking Wandell as our eighth receiver. We that's fine. It works out very nicely, but we didn't necessarily need him. If there's a pick in the 11-10 that works, I think it really makes this roster. But there's no pick 
there's no pick there that makes the roster. And so I think so that's, that's the part I, that, you know, you get frustrated by because this draft just didn't give us anything there that we would really like. It, uh, the other part of it kind of, you, you mentioned Dak Prescott. So my question in addition there would be, we take Traylon Burks. I'm trying to not force, I'm trying not force the Steelers Seahawks game stacks because I have so much of that and I love it. And I want to do it at prices that are somewhat reasonable. And I'm trying to not like overspend on San Francisco, Washington. But when we take Burks there, I mean, Jahan Dotson's not coming back to us. So if we want to go with Debo and then have one of the interesting pieces and we take Dotson, then that sets us up for either Howell or Purdy late. And then we don't feel the pressure for either Prescott or Goff. We probably take one of them and not the other. And then we take either Howell or Purdy late. Do you wish that we had gone with Dotson or, or do we still have another potential option there in round 11 that would work better? Well, I, I that's one of the things I definitely wanted to talk through with you about this build was what you felt about the receivers because I didn't love it. I, I think Dobbs is a decent wide receiver five. You've got me more concerned about Rondo Moore as a wide receiver six. But when Brandon Cooks is your wide receiver four, Traylon Burks is a pretty big bet even as a wide receiver three. We really like him. I talked to him on the last show when we took him about how my projection for him came out very optimistic. But, I mean, Amon Ross St. Brown and Debo Samuel are our top two receivers. We don't take any other receivers in the first five rounds. It's thin early when you get to Brandon Cooks as your wide receiver four. Thinner than I like to be. Thinner than you like to be, certainly. And as we get into the Romeo Dobbs and the Rondo Moores and then late Curtis Samuel and Wandale, we wind up with an eight-receiver build, but one that I've wondered about the, the actual upside. And as you I think you're right. I think you've parsed it well, where if that 11-12 receiver, if there was a good pick there that we really liked, this would build would have worked better. We weren't really jumping over the moon to take Ronald Moore there. We took him, ahead, I think, all right at ADP. I do agree that it would have been nicer to get a, a little bit of a price slip on him. We didn't know what to do with that turn. You also weren't a, a big fan of taking both quarterbacks in that game. We take Goff on the way back because we really didn't have another great option, as you mentioned, as you went through it. Um it, it is tricky, and I think uh, – I mean, two things. One, I was totally fine with the Bijan thing. We've joked about it. But, like, you look back and you go, man, the way this draft played out, CD Lamb in the first round would have been nice, right? Oh, like, yeah, it would because, have, it would have... I mean, if you have Gibbs, Walker, and Swift as your three backs, you're thinking, I mean, this is a tournament. I'm great. Yeah. yeah, I'm great. And then we really just needed a little more early wide receiver firepower. So it is just sort of funny that we had technical difficulty on wide receiver slash running back in the first round. Uh, and then the the um, the other thing, yeah, like Dotson, for example, is uh, a good call. I mean, is, is a situation where you were saying taking him instead of where, where were instead you saying Burks and six? We would have had to, we would have had Burks. to take him instead of Burks, which it's tough i mean he goes ahead of burks in the reality draft he had some really good stretches as a rookie which i don't think you can say for burks but still when you're looking at the overall profiles i think you're hard pressed to say even just with the big difference and and dotson had plenty of red flags in his rookie year as well but i mean burks is is still like the bigger potential star. And he's a guy who, I mean, you mentioned 25% target share as your projection. I mean, he's one of these players. Now it would be on a team that's not going to pass a ton, but I mean, he's a guy who could easily get to 30. And you don't project that because it is obviously yeah. an upper end outcome. And yet he, he could easily get to 30. He could score touchdowns. But when I'm, just to clarify for the well, listeners, when I'm doing- To get Dotson, but tactically maybe it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and just to clarify for the listeners, when I'm doing a 25% target share as my base, it's because I think exactly what you just said. There's potential for 30. I don't do, I try to make that sort of my, you know, reasonable mid ground. I don't think there's a lot of scenarios where Burks is like below 22% target share. He's going to, I think, be the main guy regardless. So that's to me, not, maybe not a true median. I'm baking in a little upside in that projection, but close to a median outcome from him. I, I like what you're thinking there. I think Dotson, I think very highly of Dotson as well. And I, I, I like getting pieces of that Washington uh, game. And um, I've taken more Dotson than Burks, actually, when I looked at my profile or my uh, exposures recently. And I wanted to correct that a little bit. So I was actually happy when we got here and, you know, wanted to take Burks. I was excited to get him. But I do, I mean, some of that's because Dotson sometimes falls a little later. But um, I do like 
clicking on dots in there. And I, the way that would have set up the quarterback stuff makes a lot of sense. Uh, the running backs, obviously, really strong for, for anything we would ever build. Bijan, um, Swift is the four, Gibbs and Walker in between there. I mean, just a, an embarrassment of running back riches. This is the second time now, Sean, that we've drafted on bananas and been really heavy on the early running backs, the young running backs, some upside profiles in the dead zone. Certainly unique for us, but something that is fun to to do because we do like those players. We don't hate running backs. It's very important that everyone make remember this draft. <laughs> but um, other than the Dak Goff thing at quarterback, it's sort of interesting, maybe not a ton of interesting. I, I kind of want to close talking about the tight end build again because we promised that on the last show. I wanted to ask you, when you are seeking these upside profiles, you talked about Dulcich going to zero. I have sort of a concern with McBride there where maybe he's still behind Ertz a little bit or that offense is just so catastrophically bad that, you know, he can get a little bit of target volume, but there's not a lot of touchdowns or what have you. Komet, obviously, there are scenarios where he can have – he's not going to go to zero totally, but he's going to have stretches of games where he's getting only two targets because their pass volume is so low. Do you consider – in looking for the breakout profiles, the the blend of the tight end room, or I mean, I, I guess I know the answer to this. I'm kind of just trying to set you up. But it, it, that was my concern is what I should say uh, when we we're talking about Michael Mayer as well, when we already had Komet, because I have concerns for Mayer that was mirror my McBride concerns where you got a lot of target earning potential in the short to intermediate ranges with the Raiders. You have potentially other tight ends that are going to make it a slower rookie season for mayor, which, you know, rookie tight ends do sometimes take a little bit of time, even though he's a really good prospect. I did like that. We grabbed Hunter Henry late. I think he's got a pretty strong floor for routes, even though they added Gasicki. We've talked about Gasicki probably going to split out quite a bit. They're kind of playing different positions, but do you have concern? Like say we would have wound up with commit McBride mayor. Do you have concern for that type of build that to me, a texture wise, is a risk for total routes. And I have a, I, that, that concerns me. And that was sort of some of the discussion we were running into on the clock at 17 and 18. I want to hear how you think through targeting upside profiles that maybe have routes concerns at tight end. The tight end position is so hard to predict for these guys in the double digit ranges because the overall production is so minimal. And we do have some guys who come out and hit, and some of them hit on a volume basis and so potentially there was a way to find them through projections now it, unfortunately in some cases it turns out to be you have a tight end room where both guys are unproven and or bad isn't exactly the right term but it kind of captures what we're looking for there in terms of what the issue is and it'll be the number two guy who emerges and gets those numbers so i think those are, are very difficult to bet on i always want to make the bet on talent and the chance that that will be the determining factor that allows a guy to consolidate. And so when I'm looking at ADP in 2023 and I'm thinking we're having rookie wide receivers score better and it's obvious that they're having an easier time transitioning to the NFL, we're starting to see a little bit of that with the tight end position. And I think that if you have a situation where the Cardinals had been more competent last year, I think if you had had Dulcich stay healthy last season, you're going to have some names from what was a pretty weak class last season where you're like, I mean, those guys actually helped. You look at Mayer being a better prospect than those players. And I think that he's being really pushed down by the lack of athleticism when, I mean, he's probably the best guy. I was kind of joking with pat when we had him on ot we were doing the tight end portion of that show and looking at the tight end prospects and i was joking with him that we were just trying to get him to say the individual words such that we could get him to actually make a clip or as sam laporta is the best tight end project prospect and he kept smiling and giving us michael mayer as the answer there well, it goes into a weaker situation, but when you look at Kincaid and Laporta and Mayer, all of those guys probably similar prospects, and you look at the different prices, I guess I don't think that the situation in Buffalo 
and then the situation in Detroit, and then the situation in Las Vegas are so dramatically different that you wouldn't also want some shares of the guy that you can get in round 18. Now, perhaps there are teams where it would make more sense to get those shares. So I was very happy to go away from it on this roster. I think that Hunter Henry is perfect for this roster because to me, I mean, Hunter Henry should probably be a 14th round pick and you can kind of throw it all out and say everybody 13 to 18 is more or less the same. But once you get into 16, 17, 18, and we're starting to draft players, especially at wide receiver, but in general, where the zero scenario is not that unlikely at all. Hunter Henry's scenario is not zero. And I don't know. I have so much Gasicki, and I, I really question that sometimes in that Henry might be the guy who is just a better pick straightforwardly. I think the Patriots offense is going to be a lot better. I don't think that they have a lot at tight end. So I think it's going to be on Armandre Stevenson and it's going to be on Hunter Henry and Gasicki. I think that Mac Jones is the next guy. When you look at those Alabama quarterbacks and I mean, they've had some struggles Tua took some time. Jalen hurts, obviously not drafted to be a starter, but you have a little bit of that time as you adjust to the NFL, you listen to what some of those guys who played with those different quarterbacks have said. And I mean, partly it's going to be the guy you played with last, or maybe your you know, better friend or what have you, but those guys are on board with Mac Jones being a similar type of QB. Hunter Henry in round 18, when you get locked out of some other things, I think that that's perfect for this team. And so I'm, I'm really glad that we went that route and that he was available there. I think that the picks that you make, especially right now, before we get into late August and have a better idea about how some of these teams are going to really run and you know who the third wide receiver even happens to be, if you can draft a player that you know is going to play, and that does have a decent background, even if 2022 was a down year, and that's why you can get in there, and he's going to have volume, that's the way that you maximize the value of July drafts. Yeah, completely agree. Henry, all of the years of his career, five years, he didn't play at all in 2018. Remember, he tore his ACL in the offseason. But from 2016 to 2021, targets per hour run of at least 18%, maxed at 21%. 0.2% early in his career in 2017, but right in that 18 to 21% range, which is good for a tight end who's running a decent number of routes. He's always been pretty efficient on that. Good profile. Was a good player. At one time was a, a single-digit round pick in fantasy. <clears throat> Last year, 13.6% targets per run. About five percentage points lower than his previous career low. Still efficient, just didn't get a lot of targets in this offense the way it was constructed. Jacoby Myers is gone. You talked about the wide receivers are not particularly strong. Um, it's going to be Ramondre. It's going to be the tight ends. And he's, I mean, I just, I don't feel like that 13.6 number from last year is something that I want to bet to continue. And if it rebounds to the 18% range and he runs, you know, even just 400 routes, you would like to see your tight ends run 500 plus routes, but 400 routes would be, Fine, as an 18% target spot run for an 18th round tight end. I mean, that's great. I mean, we'll, we, we'll end up being really happy with that is basically what I'm getting at. So the math, the profile, it works good on my end when I look at it from a projection sense. You were saying 2022 down year for him. That was sort of the point I was trying to drive home. Very much the case when you dig into his numbers. And the rest of his career doesn't show that same trend. So some potential for him to be a bounce back and a good 18th round pick there. I like the tight end room with him. Cause I, I think I said at the end of the last show, I might like Henry the most. He's the one that I trust to have like the routes and to give us a little bit of floor and not ruin our team with this late tight end build. Cause part of it for me is like, look, if we can just match the, the non elite tight ends and tight ends, such a, a wasteland, as long as we're not taking zeros, as long as we can get eight points per game or something and half PPR, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit more than that that we need, but um we might not actually need a ton of upside there because we have so much upside built into this roster at running back. Certainly our receivers are a little bit of an issue. We don't actually really have a ton of upside at quarterback. There are some concerns with this roster. Maybe we did need Komet or McBride to wind up being a superstar tight end and, and those upside profiles at tight end. It's a fun team. It's a Picasso team for us a little bit, Sean. Fun one to talk through. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we'll just... It's one of those ones where it's like, we'll see how it does. Some of the ones we've done like this in the past couple of years, though, and we've circled back, especially the running back heavy ones. We did a couple of mains where we did running back heavy. I mean, those have been some of our worst teams. <laughs> they've, they've worked out pretty poorly. 
they do tend to struggle, but part of that is that you do get the landmine issue. And so if you can avoid that year's landmines, you look at the projected points for these guys. Again, I said it on the last show. I think it bears repeating. We're likely to see more running backs in the flex this season as a result of the ADP shift. You talked about not having the upside at QB. That's the thing that always just you know, bums me out about the 2023 QB window. And yet Blair has a great article out on the site about how that's probably going to work better than it has the last couple of years in underdogs. The other thing is just uh, if you're going to have QBs with a little bit less upside, they do need to be correlated and they are in this build. And so and if we get the seasons we're talking about from Amon Ra and Brandon Cooks, I think the upside is a little bit less of a concern. So all that works together. I also think that you're making a bet on Romeo Dobbs, which I like. You don't want to have that in every draft. But if you're saying that he's going to be a breakout player or one of these guys who does find his way into the starting lineup quite a bit, then it ends up working out. I also think the thing with the wide receivers here, you know that your team is going to have to be relatively healthy to accomplish the objectives that you have in any sort of best ball situation. I think that's more the case when your wide receivers are a little bit, I wouldn't say weaker, but just you don't have as many of them with as much scoring potential. We need the guys with the high scoring potential on a weekly basis to more or less stay healthy. But if that happens, I like the way this team is put together. And I mean, again, to kind of wrap it up with the tight ends, Hunter Henry gives us the volume. I think that Komet and McBride give us interesting spike week guys. If they have the spike weeks at the right times, then then you're set. So we would have preferred a better round 11 pick. But other than that, Ben, and we would have preferred me to not have not really technical difficulties, more just uh, rank human error. You remove those two <laughs> elements, and this is a really fun team. Yeah, it's a good one um i yeah I, I don't got i don't got a lot more i, I, I gotta run I'm, I'm about to head off to a vacation john but uh excited to to draft more teams with you I, this what this does make me want to do is draft another team where things fit together more i mean it, it that is one of the things that happens when you draft a team and things don't really fit together very well you're like yeah but i just want to do it better <laughs> and so we will come back and have more of these drafts for you throughout the summer. There's so much fun. That'll do it for today's episode of Stealing Bananas. I'm Sean Siegel with me as always. And as he runs out the door here is Ben Gretsch. You can follow him at Yards for Gretsch. Make sure you sign up for Stealing Signals. Make sure you sign up for Stealing Lines. So excited for the projection info that he's got coming. I don't know how you could listen to this show and hear the information from Ben and not want to get signed up for that. We'd love to have you over at Rotoviz. You can join us using the coupon code RV Radio 2023 at checkout for a 10% discount on a one year subscription. As always, this was an underdog draft. We'd love to join you over there. Coupon code Rotoviz, 100% match up to $100. Leave us a rating and review. We love you guys. This is so much fun. We'll talk to you soon.